When Black Buck Games released Need for Speed Underground in 2003, the street racing theme that was becoming popular through other forms of media rejuvenated the series, selling close to 10 million copies across all platforms. Although it drastically changed the presentation, its diverse gameplay, customization options, and online multiplayer made it a highly addictive racer. The fans wanted more. The developers wanted more. And Need for Speed Underground 2, a true sequel and continuation, released on November 2004 on the PC, Xbox, PlayStation 2, GameCube, Game Boy Advance, and Nintendo DS, is exactly what they got. Set right after the events of the first Underground title, you've just reached the heights of fastest driver in Olympic City. I don't think there's anyone out there that can beat you. Nothing can stop you, but an anonymous man offers you to join his crew. There's room in my posse for you, and I ain't taking no for an answer. But that's exactly what you do. Meanwhile, Samantha calls you of a celebratory party nearby. However, before you can get there, a Hummer flashes its lights causing you to crash and total the car. I just had to take care of a... a little problem. Six months later, Samantha hooks you up with Rachel Teller, who loans you her car parked outside the airport so you can get to the dealership. A perfect way to introduce the open world gameplay. After arriving and using the money from the totaled Skyline GTR, you choose your first car and start all over again, finding races across the city, winning them to rebuild your reputation and design the coolest set of wheels. While Rachel serves as an agent and mentor throughout underground mode, the race scene here is big. Whatever you like, you can find it, if you know where to look. Supposedly, Caleb Reese, the guy that took you down at the beginning, is the leader of the Wraiths, sorry it's hard to pronounce, and their intentions are to take over the street racing scene in Bayview by manipulating sponsors in their favour. Unlike Underground 1 where the cutscenes are full motion, the story here presents itself in comic book form. The presentation of the story is aged better, but it's both easy and hard to follow. It uses the exact same premise as the predecessor, and a cutscene only really appears once an hour or two. I don't know whether to say that's a good or bad thing. I think there could have been more cutscenes because they go for about 30 seconds. They can be skipped, and it was easy to forget what was going on. I don't think the developers cared, and to be honest, Neither do I. I care as little as the message I get before every race. Yeah, it's impossible to get even a hint of respect in Bayview. I won't have to do anything more than drive. He's nothing but a showboat and loser. It's a need for speed game. All I want to do is win races, design cars, and drive around the city. By the mid-2000s, the open world genre had exploded in popularity thanks largely to Rockstar Games with their Grand Theft Auto and Midnight Club franchises and other titles were taking advantage, including Jack and Daxter, Mafia, and Simpsons Hidden Run, to name a few. So it was really a matter of time before the Need for Speed series would follow in the same route. Which makes sense, because this style of gameplay works near flawlessly in Underground 2. Scattered on the map are event hubs, dealerships, stores to customize your car, and your personal garage, meaning every piece of tarmac you see can be driven on. To put things into perspective, Underground 1 has 40 kilometers of racetrack. If you look at this map, this gives you a good idea of how much tarmac is used throughout the whole game. But in Underground 2, because the whole map is drivable, it has close to 200 kilometers, five times as much. The map of the city can be opened at any time, and you can mark where you want to go, giving you the shortest route to get there. There's no menu selection, nor can you take a cab and skip the journey, but at least you don't have to follow another driver who has a car twice as fast and unpredictable as yours. Speaking of that, you do have the option to interact with other drivers on the map, but what you do instead is try to outrun him or her for a bet. Man, stop rolling around like you ain't got a clue, and race! I assume it was implemented so that if you don't have enough bank and can't beat a specific event because your car isn't fast enough, you have this one-on-one -on -one to dig yourself out of the hole. Oh man, the road pulled through for you on this one. Just make sure you always win because in Rachel's words, that bank will disappear. 
Occasionally, it can't tell whether or not you've overtaken the driver, but at least you don't have to worry about attracting unwanted attention. Once again, the wanted system is non-existent. Whether you favor it or not is a matter of preference. Though having absolutely no police in a city filled with street races sounds highly absurd. Graphically, the city gets a bit carried away with the product placement, and the standard brightness settings are set to the lowest. Oh, it isn't. That's odd, because it's too dark, even by night racing standards. Despite this, here's a comparison. It's just more detailed overall from the vehicle to the weather effects and draw distance. That's a beautiful sight of the city right there. And even the console version has a native widescreen option while the cutscenes remain windowed. However, this is a console version and it's been over a decade, so it's not the best way to explain the graphics. Like the predecessor, the frame rate can be choppy on the start line, and there's the occasional hilarious glitch. But none of them are game breaking, and back then, this was one of the best looking arcade races out there. Even by today's standards, it still doesn't look too bad. And also like the predecessor, it has a combination of hip hop, electronic, punk and hard rock music which can be toggled in the menu, and is fantastic for the most part. All but one of the events, including Circuit, Sprint, Tournament, Tag, and Drift Return are Underground 2, so I don't need to explain how the races are structured twice. However, some of these have been noticeably edited. The Drift event, for example, you now have opponent drivers on the track scoring points in real time. You have 30 seconds left to cross it yourself, so you can't take your time. But then again, speed equals more points. Because one part of the map includes outskirts up in the hills, you have a few drift events set up there as well, which help maintain your speed, but you have to avoid traffic at the same time. And if you take the drift courses from Underground 1 and turn them into a circuit race, you get Street Cross. Seriously, literally every single track is the same, including the backgrounds. You'll think more about the right racing line and steering opponents into a barrier in the process, because the AI can be compared to Gran Turismo 4. While you have a map with all the races required to complete the game, hidden ones can be found which earn you more bank. Occasionally you'll get a phone call from a driver about a race event hidden in the area of a map. Yo dude, got any details on the rumors of racing in the Beacon Hill area? I hear it's a bunch of newbies with more bank than brains. Should be easy pickings. Make sure you write it down and know all the names of every area of the city, because you'll only hear it once. I just do them whenever I accidentally run into one. Why they couldn't just send you a message about it, like they do for literally everything else, is beyond me. This open world setting increases the track diversity, almost to the point where you can even compare it to the predecessors before Underground. And because it's large in scope with aforementioned 200 kilometers of tarmac, almost every single event uses a different track if you count reverse variations. However, it has the same problem as the first underground. While traffic is only excessive whenever you're free roaming the city, there's still the odd moment when a car appears at a blind spot costing you the whole race. It also doesn't help that this game is too dark and the lights are dimmer than stars in the sky. I'm not saying traffic shouldn't be there, but it can frustrate you occasionally. Therefore, I only use nitrous oxide for emergency situations. As long as you have quick reflexes and track memorization, it's all good. Like Underground 1, the drag and drift events have their own unique controls, which I don't need to explain twice, and the stats on the car affect the way it drives, like you'll notice the difference between a Toyota Supra and a Hummer. Also, I'm using the racing wheel, and implements the full 900 degree rotation as standard, so you'd assume it enhanced the experience, just like any other racing game I've used with it. Well, with a regular controller and keyboard, it's fine, but unfortunately, at least with the wheel I'm using, the car becomes tail happy no matter what speed you're going. When you have the full 900 degree rotation set, it doesn't steer enough, and in the drag races, it's virtually unplayable. The wheel sensitivity makes it very easy to change lanes when you don't want to and totals the car. When you drive with the interior view, it feels more manageable. The type of car also plays a factor, and I'm not saying every single racing wheel controls like this. You might have one that works brilliantly with Underground 2, but overall, I'm pretty disappointed. With the wraiths true to their word, the opponent drivers are quite aggressive on the track. Look at the way they swerve all over the place to avoid being overtaken, like they're trying to warm up the tires or something. Rubber banding becomes more and more obvious as you progress through underground mode, but it's never impossible to win, so 
fair enough. In fact, there's no real difficulty curve or spike throughout the whole game. The lack of car damage might also have something to do with it. When Rachel says at the beginning, There better not be a single mark on it. What has she got to worry about? And how does the car get totaled at the beginning? This makes you less likely to use the brakes if you can just use the barriers to slow you down later in the corners. After all, if you mess up, you can use the nitrous oxide to get you back on track more than once, because you can fill it up with flamboyant driving. Yeah, that's the sole purpose of the style point system in Underground 2, and gone is the ranking system, which is fine because it didn't make that much sense in the predecessor. Instead, you earn reputation points. The only way to earn them is through winning, and this attracts sponsors. Believe it or not, not, this is the core, the most important part of Underground from a career and storyline perspective. When you unlock a new part of a map, you get different sponsor opportunities with unique signing bonuses, earnings per race, and the types of events to complete, marked as a cross on the map. I'm always trying to check which one earns you the most money. Funny how racing companies are sponsoring illegal activity, but whatever. These sponsors are also a ticket to the Underground Racing League. Set in closed circuits on a speedway or airport, occasionally structured like a tournament. These are the most important races of Underground Mode, as they earn you the most money, trigger the story cutscenes, and are the only way to unlock new cars. Aluminum and steel isn't crafted any better than this. Select a sweet set of wheels right here. The car list in Underground 2 has gone up from 20 to 29. The developers realized back then that the tuna scene was expanding their horizons, so most of the new cars are built outside of Japan, including Audis, Fords, and sports utility vehicles. For the first and only time in the series so far, SUVs can be driven, customized, and raced. Because I don't really care for them unless they're serious off-roaders, I wasn't even trying when it came to customization, especially because you only get 70% of what you can put on a normal car. You don't get as many cars as a Gran Turismo or Forza title, but once again, the customization options are tremendously diverse. Light years ahead back then, yet very simple to get your head around. It's easy to design something you could be genuinely proud of. As usual, I spend most of my bank on performance first, because winning is the best way to be recognized on the street. It's an unusual sight, seeing what appears to be a stock Ford Mustang, but I make mince meat out of the opponents, but you have to make the car stand out, because like Underground 1, what you install affects the star rating, and you have to appear on magazine and DVD covers to appease your sponsors, and progress through Underground mode. There was one moment when I completed almost every event possible, and realized that the URL race to move on wasn't appearing. I initially thought it was because I didn't complete enough secret races, but it was actually because my car didn't have a high enough star rating for the DVD cover, so keep that in mind. The way I see the Need for Speed Underground titles, I win races to earn additional customization options to muck around with. That's what makes it so addictive. If your car's not fast, it better be cool. According to the game's director, one feature that was highly requested at the time was the ability to tune your car for certain events. It's not really my kind of thing, especially because I was able to beat this game without my car touching the rolling road. But if you take it seriously, like if you want to beat it on the highest difficulty, it's surprisingly deep, allowing you to tune multiple aspects of a car, and each setting can be packaged for every specific event. If you want to squeeze the most speed out of your ride, then you're going to need to spend some time here. So the level of vehicle customization went to extreme heights back in 2004. However, setting underground mode on an open map has its disadvantages. Trying to figure out the best possible design for your car is a lot more tedious, because the stores for body parts, visuals, accessories, and performance need to be found to customize those aspects of the car, which are easily found by the color of the light. But say you have a paint job you're satisfied with and confirm it. But after you go to a car specialty store, the neon and window tint doesn't work. Or something else you want hasn't been unlocked yet. So you go back to the visual store, waste more money- Oh, it doesn't match the body kit. It's probably just me, because if you don't care about what you put on the car, so long as the star rating goes up and you can progress through the game, this isn't a problem at all. But if you're trying, you might as well quit underground mode and customize the cars from the main menu. After all, it's part of the fun of Need for Speed Underground. 
Speaking of that, one thing I forgot to mention in my Underground 1 review was that when you customize cars in the main menu, the only parts available are the ones you purchase from Underground mode, severely limiting what you can do, and you only have access to everything until you beat the whole game. But in Underground 2, when you unlock a set of body kits, rims, paint options, vinyls, etc. In Underground mode, they're unlocked in the main menu as well. So you have more creative freedom when customizing cars for other game modes including split screen multiplayer. Cheers. So about having separate stores all over Bayview, it's only a minor nitpick, but I would save a lot more time if I could customize everything in one go and confirm from there. Because I like to race the cars just as much as designing them. The least you can do is change parts you already purchased in your personal garage, where you can also manually save your progress, view your sponsor details and select which car to try. Because if you unlock another area of the map, you also earn a free slot for your garage and can select any car available, however you still have to buy parts for it. And if you're concerned about previous events being erased after a new set have been replaced, another thing you can do is go back to the events you missed out on which are clearly indicated. Rachel will remind you after you beat the game. It's easy to say that it's Underground 1, but just more of it. But after closer review, everything has been reworked in some way. It introduced open world gameplay, added dozens more events and customization options. I could spend all day in the garage and never get bored. And it all adds up to a combined total of over 20 hours of gameplay. Commercially, Need for Speed Underground 2 matched its predecessor, selling close to 11 million copies across all platforms during the height of the tuna scene and span of the franchise's most successful period. This is one of the greatest racing games of the 6th generation and a brilliant sequel to an already solid title that I can't recommend enough no matter what system you buy it for. 